Thank you, Sanjeev. Um, I had nothing to, to, disclose, to disclose, but I feel like I should disclose something now. Um, so firstly, yes, I am a dietitian. Please don't throw rocks at me. The fellow dietitians do that enough. Um, and secondly, my husband kindly pointed out this morning that I'm not a doctor. Um, and everybody who were presenting at the conference is a doctor. So I was like, well, thank you very much for that lovely husband, for the support. OK. So you all know me, um, and I'm really looking forward to meeting all of you. I probably should go back, actually, um, over the next few day, oh, next couple of days. But we'll get straight into it now. So low-carbohydrate diets are implemented for many reasons, as we know. Weight loss, blood glucose management, in particular in my role, um, but also reducing seizures and epilepsy. There's many reasons. But no matter what the incentive is, a complete macronutrient approach is essential, essential to the success and longevity of the diet. This presentation today will look at a clinician's guide to a complete and healthful low-carbohydrate approach to, diabe to dietary management. So what is a low-carbohydrate diet? Does anybody want to offer their... Uh, um, their explanation, because it seems to be the million dollar question and it's not one really anyone is confident to answer. So is there a percentage of total energy from carbohydrate we should eat? And if so, what is it? Is it the Mediterranean diet, the paleo diet, a keto diet, a carnivore diet? Um, it all seems to depend on what your Google search is. But a Google search can get pretty scary. So 50% of your search might come up with anti-low-carb websites, while the other 50% seem to be low-carb evangelistic. The anti-low-carb camp is quite often made up of experts or health professionals who insist that the diet is too low in fiber or too high in saturated fat. And it's basically because they're beholden to that long-standing diet, diet heart hypothesis, whether that be either to toe the line of their um, professional body or just due to ignorance to the emerging evidence. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the low-carb diehards, let's say, and they have websites, support groups, blogs, and they take a very strong stance on what they believe low carb should be and the only way to follow a low carb diet. And these views aren't helpful. They often leave people feeling overwhelmed and incapable and can create um, feelings of inadequacy and guilt. So in any case, neither group is supportive or helpful to someone looking to make positive changes to their nutritional health. So is there any definition that we can rely on? Well, there's no scientifically agreed definition, but one widely used was, pro was proposed by Feynman in 2015. And this has really formed the base basis for which many clinicians and researchers use, use to define different levels of carbohydrate restriction. So I won't be referring to this again, and you'll understand why. So that brings me to my question, does it even matter? At the end of the day, your low carb diet depends on you. It needs to suit your needs, your goals and your lifestyle. And most importantly, it needs to meet your personal nutrition requirements. And can we meet nutrition requirements on a low carb diet? Well, yes, we can, lo and behold. So the nutritional value of a low carb diet is one of the main perceived issues of the medical community. And I've presented to this top, about this topic on, uh, to multiple medical groups in Australia, and I'll also be, also be presenting next weekend um, on an international forum to many endos and um, doctors around the world on this exact point. Done well, a low carb diet has been shown to meet the nutrition requirements in both adults and children. And I've been fortunate enough to work with a group of passionate and intelligent women to publish the proof, one of whom is here today, Dr. Karen Zinn. So chase her up if you want to chat about it more. You can check out our articles, one focused on adults and one focused on children in these journals. So what is important is that it goes back to this. It's not just about reducing carbs. So how can we build a low carbohydrate diet that meets your needs, wants and your nutrient requirements? And this is how I can help you do it. So as I said, our dietary intake is much more than just carbs. Decreasing carb intake will be step one but it's what we replace it with that is just as, if not more important. Meeting energy and macro and micronutrient requirements is extremely important, not only to long-term health, but in day-to-day -day life, it will impact how you feel and will determine your ability and your motivation to maintain the dietary lifestyle. In my pra practice, I take a macronutrient approach to helping my patients lower their carb intake. 
So you've chosen to lower your carb intake for a reason and this will help us determine how low you go. It will also help us to determine your overall energy and nutrient needs and how we build upon your chosen level of carbohydrate intake from there. These are just some of the reasons that somebody might want to lower their, low, lower their carbohydrate intake and I'm sure that everyone sitting here, um, there's many more. So now that we know what your goals are, we need to know where you're starting from. If like most patients, you're eating around 220 to, sorry, most Australians, you're eating around 220 to 250 grams of carbs per day, then technically anything less than that is a lower carbohydrate diet. So it's all relative. You may be starting from scratch. You may feel like a carb addict, bouncing your way from meal to meal or snack to snack and wondering why you never have any energy and you don't sleep well. Or you may have already started to lower your carb intake and you're motivated with the benefits that you're already seeing. Where you start is up to you and it will form the foundation from which we build the rest of your dietary intake. So I thought it was best to show how I help my patients transition through a low carb diet by looking at a hypothetical case study. So let's have a look at her. She's a 32 year old woman with two children working full time. She is a long distance runner and has a goal of running a marathon in six months. So she's currently doing a lot of training, 30 to 40 Ks a week, plus some resistance training. She's always hungry, always exhausted, always tired, always craving something. So let's have a look at her, um, her goals. So she wants to maintain weight because running that much and uh, eating little is a recipe for disaster in terms of weight loss. She wants to feel satiated. She wants to get through a run um, and without eat, needing to eat beforehand and she doesn't want to eat during the run. She wants to improve her overall energy levels and reduce those feelings of exhaustion and, potential, and hopefully sleep better. So the first thing that I'll do is look at a person's current intake. And as you can see, this patient was eating carbs at every meal and every snack. She'd always been told that carbohydrates supply energy for the body, so she can't understand why she's feeling so lethargic all the time. It's the 30 to 40 Ks a week, lady, probably. <laughs> so just having a quick look at her uh, macronutrient intake. So she's eating about nearly 7,000 kilojoules a day and 177 grams of that is uh, carbohydrate, which actually isn't massive if you look at those definitions, and only 40 grams of that is fat, okay? So clearly we've got some issues with eating fat, and 126 grams of protein. So now that we have this information, the next thing we do is look at her intake or energy intake versus her energy requirements. So is she eating her overall energy needs? And if not, that will likely explain the exhaustion, the weight loss, and that's something that we'll certainly need to rectify when we decrease her carbohydrate. So I like to use a combination of a couple of energy calculations for the patient's desired weight. If there is um, a goal to lose weight, we'll use the lower weight and obviously include a activity factor as well. So you can see for both calculations, she was coming up uh, well under what she should be eating. So she should be eating around that 9,000 kilojoule mark. The next step is to determine her individual carbohydrate goals. And this is very personalized. So it needs to be based on obviously the people's goal, uh, the person's needs, goals, and lifestyle. And it must be sustainable for the individual. We want that di the diet to be long-term. So in clinical practice, I do find that about 50 grams a day is actually reasonable and attainable. It allows for variety and, sus and sustainability, and it allows the person to eat a large um, amount of your low carb or low starch vegetables and include some fruits and nuts and things like that. So our goal was 50 grams per day for this patient. The next macronutrient I look at is protein. And because meeting protein is obviously of utmost importance, so again, why do we need protein? So it's involved in building, maintaining and repairing the body's tissues. And obviously this is going to be an increased need for somebody who has such a large energy output, so particularly athletes. It's involved in hormone and enzyme production, fluid balance, immunity, again, very important for this woman. And any extra protein eaten can be used as an energy source. Again, for this lady was going to be advantageous. Then we look at the individual's considerations. So is there any taste preferences, cultural um, restrictions or beliefs? Are they vegan? Um, are they vegetarian? What is their physical activity level? Do they have higher needs for that? And what is their current protein intake? 
And then I like to look at a few different uh, of the protein recommendations, but prefer to go with the NRV upper limit of 25% of total energy, which is generally closer to a person's intake as it is anyway. Um, and also because I work with people with type one diabetes, um, protein can impact blood glucose levels as well. So we don't want to go over too high. Otherwise we need to start dosing insulin for that as well. It, um, and then that larger portion of carbohydrate also helps to fill, sorry, of protein also helps to fill that gap that we've taken carbohydrate out of. So going back to the case study, her current intake was 126 grams per day. Uh, she had no contra in medical contraindications for increasing protein. And obviously that high level of physical activity allowed us to go on that higher side. Um, she had increased demands on her muscle growth and repair and obviously her immunity due to that increased physical stress. And um, anything, any extra protein would have supplemented her energy intake. So it came out at about 130 grams per day. So she was ticking that one off already. Most of us will be. Finally, the remaining energy gap is filled with fat, which um, no doubt my favorite macronutrient. And as an example for the case study, the way I come up with that is looking at total energy, minusing what we're having for carb, minusing what we're having for protein, and that leaves us with fat and that worked out to about 157 grams for her. Now, remember that she was eating 40 grams of fat per day. So this was going to be physically the hardest bit, but also mentally the hardest bit. So what does that look like on paper? Well, this is where she was at, and this is where we wanted to go. Um, the, main, the two big ones there, as you can see, is the changes in carbohydrate and fat. That's most important. But walking away with this is not helpful, okay? That's not helpful for anybody. It's really more than about just numbers. And I work with real food, not with numbers. I help the individual turn the numbers into real food, into a flexible meal plan, if you will. I ask them to think about each meal in terms of protein serves, fat serves, and the carbohydrate of choice. And then we look at each macronutrient in terms of serving sizes and try to aim for that at each meal and snack. It's not about counting numbers. So then we set about converting their original dietary intake into a lower carbohydrate version of itself. And making that comparison gets a person really thinking for themselves about low carb alternatives to what they're currently eating. What do I think a lower carb option would be here? What do I actually like to eat? How can I make some simple swaps to start with that will gradually lower my carb intake? So then let's just check the numbers. So our agreed targets were um, in that first table. And then this is where our meal plan landed once we had actually plugged this into Foodworks. So she was really bang on with her energy intake. Her fat intake was nearly there. Her carbs were actually much lower than the 50 grams. And I find this all the time. We might have a 50 gram target, but it's generally coming out lower. And protein was still bang on. All right, sounds easy, doesn't it? And it can be with a little bit of help. So I do this a lot. So what has my experience in helping people lower their carbohydrates taught me? Well, let's start with carbs. What do I generally see with patients in clinic? Uh, basically, once someone is fat adapted and they are actually meeting those fat requirements, that their cravings and their hunger subside. Energy levels will significantly improve and sustainability is easy if the meal plan is offering variety and choice. They're generally always meeting, if not exceeding, their fibre intake as well due to the high intake of low starch vegetables. It's one of my biggest arguments with the medical community of how a low carb diet does not meet fibre requirements. Makes no sense. Now protein, so more often than not, protein targets are easily met, generally exceeded, and usually because proteins are really easy to eat in larger amounts, so people tend to increase their serving sizes of uh, meat and other animal products. Eggs, finally. And last we have fat, and Leonardo is my spirit animal in this um, picture. Uh, this is the hardest one for most people, and I see this in clinic. I often find that people are really struggling to add fat to their diet and a lot of the time it's because they've had that fat is bad drilled into them. I always say if you're a child of the like 70s, 80s, 90s, you'll have this fear of fat. 
So we spend a lot of time talking about latest research, how we're using fat as a fuel and including the importance of a variety of fats, not just sticking to one type of fat. And uh, other times that the issue is that they simply feel too full to eat anymore. And honestly, this isn't a bad, uh, bad issue to have. Uh, clearly, they've become more in tune with their body um, and their hunger signals, and that's a really liberating way to live, as I'm sure most of you know. So let's go back to our case study and see how the low-carb diet changed her life. Well, her weight remained stable despite her increased training and her increased energy intake. She was satiated, no sugar cravings. She felt she could easily skip meals and snacks. In this particular case, it wasn't what we wanted, so we need to talk about that. She could get through her long runs much easier and she recovered much quicker and she slept much better, hallelujah. Uh, she was able to run faster, so didn't have to eat in the morning before a run and she didn't have to suck back on gels during the run. Now, as many of you know, I do specialize in type 1 diabetes with a particular focus on reduced carbohydrate approach. That's what I need to call it in practice uh, to improve glucose management. So I just want to add a note here for anyone living with type 1 in the audience. If you need any more motivation to reduce your carbohydrate intake, then here it is. Along with the benefits that we've already discussed, people with type 1 can benefit even more. And these benefits are both physically and emotionally life-changing. So if you have type 1 and you're interested in lowering your carb intake, or you already are, please do check out the study released this year. I was very lucky to be a part of the University of Sydney team led by the very passionate and intelligent Jessica Turton, who spent countless hours trudging through my clinical notes to show exactly how a low-carb diet was improving the lives of many of my type 1 patients. She's also here this weekend, so grab her in one of the breaks if you want to come and um, if you want to know more or come and have a chat to me about all things type 1 because I will talk your ear off. So to end, this meme says it all. A low-carb diet can certainly meet your energy needs, keep you satiated and be sustainable if it is done well. If you know that low-carb is right for you but you feel you are struggling with energy, sleep, variety, cravings or struggling to get the help to do it right, then please do go and seek the help from an enlightened dietitian. Thank you. Thank you.